This is Behind the Saber, a student-run podcast that shows the real family at Benedictine College Preparatory. Hi, this is Jay Gerskin with Behind the Saber, a podcast that introduces you to the cadets, students, teachers, and administrators at BCP. Today, I have a trifecta of a guest, <laughs> Mr. Dell Smith. He's been a teacher, student, and administrator here, and potentially a new position. Is that yeah, correct? we do. We have a new position. Yes, started. sir. I, I, I have to be honest. I've been uh, I've been looking forward to this for about a month now. We've been talking about it. Yes, so. sir. Get, I'm excited get to podcast. get going. Yeah. Um, but um, as cadets, you know, we, we're lucky to have somebody who was a cadet. You went mm-hmm. to Benedictine, not on River Road, but at um, the Shepherd in the city. Street. Yes, sir. Um, what has been generational strong and tradition wise that you see today? Well, I think that's, it's just one of the things that makes Benedictine uh, so unique is that these, these events that are uniquely Benedictine, right? So all of the military events that we have um, are the same. Yes, um, and I think when, when, I, when I come onto campus and when I see the boys day in and day out, um, that brotherhood and that camaraderie um, is generational. Um, and it, it remains the same today uh, from the cheering section at football and basketball games, um, to just banter in the hallways. Um, I, I love seeing that. And I love, you know, I think one of the cool things about Benedictine is it's such a melting pot from um, students from yes, all sir. over the city. Yes, sir. Right? And when you, when you go to a public school, you're kind of with those same folks year in and year mm-hmm. out from, from grade school all the way through. And when, when you all show up here as as freshmen, like there's little pockets that might come from parochial schools, but yes, sir. then there's a, a slew of cadets that come from, from all over the city. So to see you all come together, and we're very class-specific, right? So our classes become close. That, that's, I take a lot of pride in that. And I guess you could uh, point to the orientation factor. Freshman year, everyone is ground zero. Everyone is a rat. Um, no one has rank. And you kind of have to come together with your brothers, um, much like you did with your class. And h- how do you celebrate with your class so many years after graduating? We do. It's interesting. Like the orientation program and process here is a lot different than when I went to school. We didn't have this finale that you all mm-hmm. have done, which I think is great. Like this culminating event that happens at the end of yes, freshman sir. orientation. Ours was kind of like, uh, congratulations, you made it, uh, and <laughs> onward and upward. But uh, you're out. And, and, and you, you mentioned coming in with no rank. It's interesting. Um, I don't think people realize it, but seniors also graduate with no rank because uh, we have change of command. That, that's right. Rank yes, sir. Hands. So you walk out of Benedictine the same way that, that you came in with no rank and, and equal um, as brothers. Uh, so speaking of that, like you asked the question, what does, does my class do and how do we get together? Mm-hmm. Um, it's sporadic, and I think it, it happens in waves. I think young alums are really excited about that five-year reunion because right. they get to homecoming. celebrate a benchmark, right, yes, at sir. homecoming. And then the, the 10-year reunion is impactful. And, and I think people get busy, and people start to live their own lives and, and, and have families and move around the country and chase their careers. And uh, I think we, as, as schools, have to do a better job of continuing to engage um, those, those 15 and, and 20 year graduates. Um, I think Harrison Towton, um, who's our director of alumni, is, is gonna be great in that role in, in bringing people back. She's got some just awesome initiatives around homecoming that we're gonna start to celebrate some of those key reunion classes. Um, but my class is really starting to come back together now. And I think that 20-year reunion yes, sir. Was, was one of those well, moments uh, that it happened. I can't wait. So I get 20 years later, I get a, a regroupance. It happens yeah. faster than you think. Yes, sir. Trust me. <laughs> well, um, you said um, everybody goes out on their own careers. Mm-hmm. Um, when you graduated Benedictine, you went on to become a great coach in college, on the college level. Mm-hmm. Um, how did Benedictine, um, showing you what leadership was, um, translate to a coaching leadership position? Um, you know, everybody defines leadership differently, right? And it's, it's one of these, I think, hot topics. People write books on it. There's all this curriculum yes, on leadership. And I, I truly believe 
You know, leadership is guiding people to do something that you want them to do because they want to do it, right? And not because I told them to do it or because somebody said to do it, but genuinely because they want to do it. And, and you get those, those the, the best results because of that. And I think, you know, my time at Benedictine, um, I wanted to be, to be good. I wanted to be a cadet. And I think that this school kind of breeds that mentality yes, uh, sir. where you accept and excel at your role. Um, so I, I took that into my coaching career and, and, and found some success, certainly. And um, as a coach, what was the feeling um, coaching a player and seeing them improve? Well, it's, it's very similar to being here. I mean, I, I still consider myself a coach. I don't think that that particular title is um, – earmarked just towards athletics, right? Yes, you know, you're, you're trying to have an impact on um, young people's lives. You're trying to guide them towards making better decisions. Um, seeing that transformation, I was talking about this with Major Ramos just at lunch yesterday, like to see even your transformation um, from, from freshman you, to sir. senior year, like we, we take great pride in that, right? To see, you know, you become, you know, going from being more of an introvert to now more of an extrovert, right? And that, that comes with confidence. And I think you gained that o over your time here. Yes, sir. I think I think I did too. Right? I mean, <laughs> yes, it's sir. apparent. Let's talk about this, right? Like this podcast. Like this is your baby, right? And this, yes, is, this is your idea that's come to fruition. And everyone that I've talked to has has been really positive about their feedback on this podcast, right? It's been a long time coming. It's an idea that you had that you've seen through and you know, you're doing all the editing on the back end, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so it's not just coming up with questions and, and having this conversation, right? Then you turn around and you do what some people would say be the hard work is mm -hmm. to create a finished product. And to me, Right? That, that's what it's about. It's about having an idea and having something that you want to do and seeing it through and, and making it come to fruition and then finding success with it. And that's exactly what you've done. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the Absolutely. compliment. Um, um, as your coaching career, you um, are one of the staples in the Soldiers to Sidelines. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, that program and what they do? Yeah. You know, I... Soldiers to Sidelines um, is something, you know, that's a little bit separate from my coaching career. We, we talked all the time about coaching coaches, right, yes, or, or coaching faculty or coaching y your students um, and, and coaching your players. But uh, Soldiers to Sidelines was founded in 2013 when I was coaching. I was actually a high school head coach in Washington, D.C. Um, at Bishop O'Connell High School, and Harrison Bernstein um, who is the founder and executive director of Soldiers to Sidelines, um, was on my staff. And, and we were going to all these youth league programs, and we were like, man, you know, this is daddy ball, right? Like a bunch of dads coaching their right. sons and weren't pleased with the product we were getting in high school coming out of the mm -hmm. youth leagues. And we had some active duty. We were in D.C., heavy military community. We had some active duty and some transitioning and, and veteran coaches on our staff, and we were just looked at ourselves, and we were like, you know, military makes great coaches, right? Mm -hmm. And fast forward, man, it's been 10 years. Um, what Soldiers to Sidelines does is we, we work with active duty military, transitioning, veterans, mill spouses, Gold Star families, and we offer coaching certification so. curriculum that's, that starts online. Um, started in football, but we now have football, basketball, soccer, rugby, sports performance, um, adaptive sports, um, a lot of different, you know, sports that they can pursue. Um, we do coaching certification curriculum, high human skills, technical coaching, and we have a continuing education program on the back end, and we help with our active duty and veteran and transitioning military members and their families transition out of the military. We help repurpose their skills and at the same time have an impact on tens of thousands of young athletes and young people across yes, the sir. country because we place them in coaching roles based on their skill set. So we've got um, 
soldier coaches in running youth leagues all across the United States. We've got coaches that are on high school. Gunnery Sergeant Finley is a soldier yes, sidelines alum, and he's here at Benedictine. Um, I love, and I think you would agree, Gunny. right? Yep. We love Gunny. He's had a tremendous impact. And, and he has. Yes, he has. We've got soldier coaches on NFL coaching staffs, and I, I just showed um, – Mr. Grapes, a picture of two soldier coaches of ours, um, Marcus Karlstrom and Dustin Lawless, both, both infantry Marines that are coaching at UNC and WVU wow. and coached against each other <laughs> in the bowl game, really? uh, which was just okay. kind of a, a full circle moment for us. Um, that is it's truly, it's truly amazing. Yeah. It is. So it's been great, and it's yes, been impactful. Uh, one last coaching question. Uh, do you got a funny coaching story you'd want to say? A funny coaching story. Um, I was actually watching videos with, with, you know, so after you come off the practice field and you sit down with the coaching staff and you watch the film of practice, you start to see things, or, or you start to see things that, that other people didn't see, right, mm -hmm. that were happening on the side and things like that. But we were watching a clip of myself getting taken out by players like after the play and there's I've got like five of them saved on my phone where you know the, the catch is is happening okay. over here but the pass rush I, I used to stand behind the offensive line and they somebody's rushing you. and they fall down and like take out my legs or something so it was like a blooper reel um that I don't share with anybody else yes. what do you think about uh being a coach helps with being an administrator and a teacher yeah I think it's, it's a really good question and I think so many people in their minds have this idea of what being a college football coach is, right? They think it's just with a whistle, out on the field, coaching football, right? And then you kind of go yes, home. And I can say I just have a deep appreciation for my time coaching small college football because you have to do it all, right? So you're working hand-in-hand -hand with the admissions uh, department on whether or not students can get in. So you have this deep understanding of the college admission process. You're working with students on FAFSA and financial mm -hmm. aid, so you, you understand sure. how scholarships sure. work, and it helps you as an administrator um, prepare your students for, for that step. As a high school coach, I, there, there's probably 50 kids that we sent on on varying levels of financial aid and scholarship, so I have a deep understanding mm -hmm. of what that process and recruitment process yes, looks like. You're doing NCAA uh, worksheets on mm -hmm. students' grades, right? You're, you're managing a, a scholarship and financial aid budget. You're managing an operating budget. You're managing the salaries of your coaching staff. Um, you're helping your college students stay on track to graduate and make sure that they're taking the right classes and in, in the correct amount of numbers. Um, you're having to work hand in yes, hand with faculty and academics in a college setting, right? You have to answer to the athletic directors and board of trustees about your performance. So th there's, that is administration, right? You're working yes, with sir. faculty and students, you're developing curriculum. I don't care if it's um, for, for the school or for your program, it's, it's the same concept. So that time um, coaching football, as people just think it is, <laughs> um, I think has served me well just in Regardless of how you look at it, you're working um, in higher education, right? You're on a college campus, you're, on, you're, you're at a high school, and you, you can't just be in this football silo. You have to be an active yes, member of the entire academic community. And after all that, do you miss coaching? Um, I don't because I think okay. like we talked about earlier, yeah. I still feel like I am. Yes, right? yes sir, yeah. Uh, coaching the Benedictine students is... Coaching the students, coaching faculty, right, yes, when they're sir. struggling with something. And in Soldiers to Sidelines, coaching the coaches. I think, um, to me, coaching is a calling. In, in teaching is coaching, right? When, when you're a college football coach, you're standing up in front of, you know, your, your players or your yes, students, sir. and you're, you're asking them to learn information. I think the difference between teaching in that environment and teaching in an academic environment is if, if your players fail the test, you get fired, right, right. in coaching, right? If, they, if yes, they can't implement the game plan and they don't win, right, that's a direct reflection on you. Sometimes in academics, if your students don't perform at a high level, there's no recourse. Mm -hmm. You also head up the Hunting Con Conservation Club. Um, what appealed you to that? So when I, when I just look at uh, students, Benedictine and St. Gertrude's overall 
high school experience, like we have a responsibility to offer programming um, that our students are interested in. And traditionally, there are different clubs, and it could be a chess club or photography club mm -hmm. or robotics yes, club. And, um, and then we offer sports teams, athletics teams, football, basketball, softball. Um, and, and that is an outlet for, for students that are passionate about those things. And I think what we really came to realize um, with our student population and the demographic of our school is that there's a large amount of students that, that have a deep appreciation for the outdoors. And, you know, I, I certainly do. Um, and a deep appreciation for God's creation. And some of them have access to that through their parents and through how they grew up. And then others, I think, might be interested in it, think they're interested in it, but don't have the access. So we, we pride ourselves in, in offering access to, you know, we, we do hunting and fishing trips. Yes, we have a heavy conservation component um, to our work. And, and, and it truly has been, I think, a transformative experience. There's no other high school in the country that, that's doing what we're doing. Um, and we took a trip out to Montana right. last summer, which was, it was impactful for me. So I know, I can't imagine what it was like for everybody 16 else, or right? 17 year old yes, student. Sir. And uh, I mean, I know from just the weekend trips, I'll come into school and I'll hear a story from somebody else, yeah. right? Um, being a student who has went to Benedictine and graduated, you obviously came back to BCP mm -hmm. to teach and then become an administrator. What was that feeling coming back on the campus as a different role? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like returning to your alma mater can be, uh, can be dangerous. And I say that because you have, I think like I, I just had such a great experience at Benedictine, right? I, I, I truly yes, feel like the people in, in this school saved my life at a, a very impactful time. I'm an influential time in my life. So it's kind of like, and I've referenced this in the past, it's kind of like your, your favorite restaurant from, from 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's just best left a great memory, you know? Right. And, and you revisit those yes, places and you're disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I was very concerned about returning to my alma mater and, and being disappointed about the product that was being offered. And wow, this isn't the same. And I think... You know, so many of our alums oftentimes think back on, on their experience here and, and automatically want to say, you know, how much different it was and how much, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is that it's not, it's better. It's better. Um, and I was, I was just so taken back that yes, the sir. programming is better, the education is better, the offerings are better, yes, the facilities are better. Um, and that made me really proud because, you know, you want that for places that you love. You want for them to continue to find success and you want for them to get better over time. And, and Benedictine and St. Gertrude have done that. Yes, sir. And, and with that, we have built almost two campuses on this property now. Uh, we have a St. Gertrude's beautiful um, school um, right behind ours. Mm -hmm. And what is the direction as, um, as BSOR grows? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in, in this new role um, that I'm taking on as, as vice president of mission, right? So that, that role kind of, right, it's mission alignment. It's, it's ensuring yes, that both of our schools uh, remain committed uh, to the mission of Benedictine schools and to the mission of St. Gertrude and mission of Benedictine. And, um, you know, when I, when I look at the strategic plan that we're working through right now and um, the, the, the coordinate, separate but coordinate leadership programs that... Um, initiative that we've launched at both schools. Ms. Pickrell did just an excellent presentation um, at our faculty in service the other day. Right? About, shout out Ms. Pickrell. <laughs> right? Shout out to Ms. Yep. Pickrell. Uh, she's a pro. Um, and, but, you know, she gave a presentation not that St. Gertrude wasn't teaching leadership. It was that St. Gertrude is being more intentional about how they teach leadership and mm -hmm. the, the positions and offerings that that they have um, yes, for their girls. And when you look at Benedictine, right, we have a vehicle for leadership, right? We, we have a military program that's very outward facing. A chain of command. Yeah, right. it's the first thing that you see. And it's like, okay, what could we do 
at St. Gertrude for, for them to have a similar right. model with, without it being military. And I think that her and Ms. Rentschler have just done a masterful job in, in coordinating that. So that's exciting. That is um, very exciting. That's I think the, the development on campus um, is, you know, I will give Mr. Grapes a lot of credit. When, when we do something here, uh, we do it at a high level. Um, and, and so often you see schools go into campaigns or design buildings and the, the building is a, you know, a fraction of, of what the original vision was. Yes, and if anything here, you know, we have this vision and then the building is better than, right. than what we we anticipated, and I have I have no doubt that you know if you see our gymnasium and you see the new St. Gertrude building, and I have no doubt that the new athletic facilities out front will, will be much of the same. I'm excited to come back on to the uh, grounds when I'm older as well. Um, I can't wait to see how many changes will happen by then. This is, we, it's, this is not UVA, Jake. We're okay. not calling it the grounds, right? <laughs> okay. Kids, where it's on yeah, campus, yeah. right? On campus. Um, a few uh, last couple questions, yeah. right? Do you have a favorite BCP event? Well, I, I love when we win state championships. I tell you that, like that was that was <laughs> the last ten minutes of that game when when I looked back and saw um, the, everybody singing and just how happy our entire contingency was. Both schools, our alumni. Um, I was just kind of taking it in. We'd kind of put the game away, yep. and to see uh, the excitement on everyone's face, um, was, that was, was a community yeah. moment, right? It was bigger than the football team and, and, and yes, their sir. accomplishment. Uh, that, that's great for the Benedictine Schools community. Um, I think my favorite, one of my favorite events, honestly, is, is change of command. Um, and I say that because it's, it's like, it's, it's, you recognize the fact that we are in a, a cycle and that yes, new sir. leadership is coming to the school and every single class at Benedictine is different. So we've seen the body of work that this particular senior class and the legacy that they've left, which this senior class I think is one of the best that I've seen in a long time. And when you I see the so. new leadership right come into position, it's exciting because you know no year is going to be the same. They're all going to be different. and. Different classes have different strengths. Um, so that's just an exciting time for me, even though it's towards the end of the year and everybody's tired, you see this energy with, with the new leadership of the Corps of Cadets, right, for, for the next year. Yes, sir. Do you have any advice for future or current cadets that they could take for the rest of their lives? That's a, that, that's a big question. Um, I, I would say for, for future cadets, um, or, or, or students that are considering coming to Benedictine or, or St. Gertrude, uh, you know, the, the time is now, right? Like these, these yes, schools um, are, are operating at a high level. I, I see it in the programs that we offer. I see it in the quality of our faculty. Um, this is a great time to be a part of the Benedictine schools. And you're seeing it really in outcomes, right? Like where students are going mm -hmm. and the success that they're yes, finding sir. afterwards. And then for, for our current cadets and, and students, I would say, don't be afraid to, to fail at, at mm. something. Um, I think that the, the threat of failure or the fear of failure can be paralyzing for some people and crippling and they end up not achieving anything that they want to achieve in life because they're constantly worried about what's going to happen if I don't find success or if I fail at this. And, you know, Failure yes, is, is really when the learning happens, right? It is. And, and the climb is, is the fun part. Yes, sir. And just tell people you got to fail forward, right? So make these mistakes and learn from them and continue to, you know, on your climb. Well, I want to thank Mr. Smith for being on Behind the Saber. And uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope you all tune in next time. I enjoyed it. it. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you.